You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is January 18, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters. Our presenter is Dr. Dana Wallace. She's an Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA for January, I think it's the 18th, um, two, uh, 2021. Um, and I have the um, distinct pleasure this morning of welcoming Dr. Wallace um, uh, to speak with us um, for COLA. I think Dr. Wallace spoke to us a long time ago, another topic um, when we were first starting out with COLA. Um, but um, um, Dr. Wallace, for those that you don't know Dr. Wallace, she has been um, um, an allergist for a number of years and been um, very involved in the um, the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, um, and is a past president of, of the organization as well. I've worked out with her on a number of different committees over the years, um, and there's no one is, that works harder than Dr. Wallace, um, um, and I was pleased to see that she was on the Joint Task Force for the Practice Parameters. Um, recently, I spoke with Dr. Golden um, and Dr. Shaker um, about making the practice parameters more available um, to fellows and to have more um, more exposure to the practice parameters. Um, and we decided to um, incorporate this into as part of the COLA series, um, first with the introductory talk by Dr. Wallace, and then uh, following every couple of months, um, we'll have a guest speaker from the practice parameters that will talk on one of the practice parameters and kind of the salient features of that. And if, there's, and if it's been recently updated, um, why it was updated, what, what's important about the update. Um, so I'm very excited to, um, to start off this series today um, with Dr. Wallace. And um, we appreciate you being here this morning. Um, and I'll let you take over. Thanks very much, Paul. I really appreciate that, and I'm very pleased to join the entire group. I believe I'm also joined by some other uh, either current and past Joint Task Force members, Jay Portnoy and David Bernstein and David Kahn and David Golden. I noticed those in our attendance list, and I welcome you to, uh, to chip in and to share your experiences also. So what I want to do today is to share with you the mission of the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters and the value of guidelines for fellows in training and all clinicians. I served on the Joint Task Force for 15 years and as co-chair for the past, I would say, four years before I did rotate off in July of 2020. I would have to say this is the most rewarding of any of my professional activities. Now, I'm not sure if I have control over the uh, advancing. It seems to not be advancing for me. Okay, I can, I can hit return bar. Okay, so the, over the next few minutes, I want to provide you with the background, the structure, and the purpose of the Joint Task Force. I'll share with you how we develop guidelines and how those documents can help you in clinical practice. So the Joint Task Force is a volunteer, uncompensated guideline development group. We develop both practice parameters and grade guidelines, and it's sponsored and funded equally by the college and academy, our parent organizations. They, in conjunction with the Joint Task Force, will select six representatives from either group, making up our 12-member panel. We have a co-chair from each, David Golden and Marcus Shaker, that help guide us through our activities. And by mutual agreement, the guidelines are published in an alternate fashion between the publications of the Academy, that would be Jackie, and Jackie in Practice, as well as Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology for the college. 
Our goals are to develop guidelines and parameters that offer members the most updated evidence-based recommendations that they can use in clinical practice. Transparency is upheld in the search, the synthesis, the analysis, and the formulation of recommendations. We aim to update each clinical area, for example, anaphylaxis, at least every six to eight years. We will usually have two grade and two traditional guidelines under development at all times. We view the guidelines as a reference, not a document to commit to memory. We attempt to summarize the most recent literature on a general or focused area of allergy and immunology. Uh, let me provide you with a few examples of practice changing recommendations that derive from our uh, parameters. One would be the adult with venom-induced cutaneous symptoms. As their only symptom, they don't require venom immunotherapy. Adding an antihistamine to an intranasal corticosteroid is rarely, if ever, of benefit. Clinicians should not routinely perform food prick skin tests for the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Oral decongestants during the first trimester of pregnancy should be avoided. And when you administer a low or an isoosmolar non-iotic radiocontrast media, premedication with glucocorticoids and antihistamines is not routinely recommended. This is our most recent published guideline. We'll call it the updated traditional practice parameter. It provides a summary of recently published literature for the management of rhinitis. The document emphasizes what is new or changed and does not repeat everything that was in that previous 2008 rhinitis document. When compared to many of our earlier practice parameters, we have added more rigor and more transparency. So how is it useful? These algorithms that we have developed, again, they're not intended to be memorized, but to be pulled out as a reference. In fact, they will soon be available as a pocket guide that can be downloaded to a smartphone in electronic format. Algorithms were developed in this guideline for both intermittent and persistent allergic rhinitis as well as non-allergic rhinitis. Let me show you the algorithm a little closer up. This algorithm provides optimal initial treatments based upon expert opinion, available evidence when available, but many times just that expert judgment in priority order. And we have detailed footnotes that go along with this to explain some of the decision-making process. And if symptoms then persist, then we offer op uh, alternative options, additional or even maybe additional medications for a specific symptom, such as anterior rhinorrhea or nasal congestion. And if you look at the right-hand corner, you'll see that if the symptoms are not controlled, then you move to the next algorithm, which is for moderate and severe disease. So now let's turn to the stinging insect hypersensitivity 2016 practice parameter, which David Golden was our chief author. And as you'll see, we often, we also offer some very useful clinical information. There are several tables. In this table, we see that recommendations from that 2016 practice parameter vary with the recommendations that you'll find in the package insert. We need clinicians to know that. Table 5 offers a quick review for when to measure basal serum tryptase during the evaluation of a stinging insect patient. Table 6 summarizes factors to consider when making the decision to continue or discontinue venom immunotherapy. <clears throat> Pocket guides are used for a quick answer to a clinical question. For many years, the Joint Task Force has partnered with the Guideline Central in developing these digital guides. Hard copies are also available for a low cost, and there are times when they are purchased in bulk by a pharmaceutical company. 
and patient advocacy groups and disseminated not only for allergists but for primary care physicians in the community. Again, disseminating our uh, guidelines and practice parameters more widely. We have allergyparameters.org is the Joint Task Force website. This houses all of our published parameters as well as having a link to those pocket guides that I just mentioned. And you can find out everything about us if you want to go to this page. The published parameters from 1995 to 2020 total 57. 52 of those are the what we'll call the older traditional practice parameters. Four of those are grade and one is what we'll call new traditional. These cover all the major topics in allergy and immunology, such as allergen immunotherapy, atopic dermatitis, food hypersensitivity. And it's unlikely we'll be adding a large number of new items. Most of our concentration will be on keeping these up to date. So have we been productive over the years? I think we have been. And in fact, the past 10 years, 2010 to 2020, we published an average of 2.5 per year. Yes, there may be some years when we do publish less, but overall, that is our productivity. So what are we doing right now? Well, these are the guidelines under development, drug allergy, and again, someone on the call today, David Kahn, is one of those work group chairs. This is our new traditional practice parameter. The anaphylaxis is also going to represent the new traditional practice parameter. We also have two grade documents under development, one sinusitis and one atopic dermatitis. So now let's turn to the guideline development process. How exactly do we get to that finished product? Well, the topic and the question to answer must first be approved by the parent organization. The Joint Task Force will then select a work group chair and a liaison to that work group. The work group chair and the Joint Task Force will invite committee members, and then that work group develops the document and recommendations. That's going to take months to maybe even longer than a year to get that final product. When they have it, uh, an excellent draft, they're going to send it to the Joint Task Force, and we will review and edit that document and then return it back to the work group. The work group then revises it, and together we agree on a final product. This is then sent for external review. The college and the academy appoint official document reviewers and invite open member review by posting on their respective websites. The Joint Task Force then goes through each comment and suggested revision, making changes where appropriate, and documenting the suggestions that came forth. We then approve a final document with our organization, submit to the journal that's up for receiving the next practice guideline, and at this stage, it's either published without further review, or there are times that the journal will have their own reviewers prior to publication. From 1995 through 2017, the Joint Task Force developed what we called summary statements, and those relied upon the Shackle system of categorizing evidence, going from one to four, with one A being meta-analysis of randomized trials, and one B being at least one randomized trial. But level three, for example, would be a comparative trial, while level four would be expert opinion. Then we also had strength of recommendation. But as you will notice as you look through that list, it was dependent only upon the category of evidence with, for example, A matching one in the category of evidence and D matching four, or based in part on an extrapolation from one, two, or three. Following the eight recommendations for guideline development published in the Institute of Medicine in 2011, we started to see a significant increase in national and international grade guidelines. 
GRADE, that's the all capital letters, G-R-A-D-E, became the gold standard of guidelines, engendering respect from professional organizations as well as policy makers. And as the Joint Task Force, we started to realize that we needed to start moving in that direction for fear that if we didn't change, we'd be left behind with guidelines that would be demoted in significance and overlooked by policy makers. So what were those eight recommendations that came forth from the IOM? It was to establish transparency, to manage conflict of interest, to have representative group composition, perhaps even involving stakeholders other than physicians, systematic review, to establish evidence foundations and rating of strength, to have an evidence-based medicine articulation of recommendations, external review, and to update in a timely manner. So what we did during 2012 to 2017 is to gradually move in that direction. And I think Jay Portnoy really directed us to do this. So we started to add to the shackle grading system a level of recommendation strength to our summary statements. And we called those strong, moderate, and weak, or no recommendation. And as you're going to see, this very closely followed what became the GRADE recommendation system. So GRADE makes a change because the clinical recommendation is based not only on the quality of the evidence, but it's based upon patient values, benefits and harm, cost, and acceptability. So much more goes into that. So what does GRADE stand for? Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. The systematic approach was used, is used to make clinical recommendations, usually for the diagnosis and treatment, but at times it could be for prognosis or harm. Following an extensive literature search, there is a systematic review and meta-analysis and then a determination of the quality of the evidence. The guideline writing group, composed of both the Joint Task Force and the work group, then determined the strength of recommendation. GRADE will make a clear distinction between the quality of the evidence and the strength of the recommendation. One could, for example, have moderate quality of evidence, yet low to very low strength of recommendation based on patient preferences or perhaps on the, the cost to implement that recommendation. The overall importance of an outcome versus an alternative strategy for patient care is also considered. Evidence can be downgraded or upgrading using explicit criteria. Transparency is mandated during the entire development process. And there is a pragmatic interpretation of the recommendation provided for all stakeholders, be that the clinician, the patient, or the policyholder. One of the first steps is to place the question under consideration into a PICO format. Let's take an example from the peanut diagnostic grade guideline. The population would be adults and children presenting for suspected peanut allergy. Intervention would be to perform a diagnostic test for peanut allergy. Comparator would be not to perform a diagnostic test. And the outcome would be how accurate is the history in determining the need for a diagnostic testing for peanut allergy. Here we see four categories of certainty of evidence. Randomized studies start as high meaning there is a high confidence that the true effect is close to the estimate of effect. On the other hand, observational studies start as low, meaning that there is limited confidence in the effect estimate. And as you'll see later, these can be elevated or demoted based upon other factors within the evaluation. So what are the factors that rate for which a uh, recommendation uh, can be rated down. Risk of bias, imprecision, 
inconsistency, indirectness, publication bias. But it can also be upgraded, large magnitude of effect, dose res response gradient, or residual confounding would increase the magnitude of effect. So let's take a closer look at upgrading first. For large magnitude of effect, one can upgrade one level if the relative risk is greater than 2 or less than 0.5. And for two levels, it could be upgraded if the uh, relative risk, is, uh, risk ratio is greater than 5 or less than 0.2. Certainly, a dose-response relationship, which is easy to understand, could relate to a increase in the uh, uh, level of grade, or a residual confounding could actually result in the effect size being increased. Upgrading is used more for cohort studies, where we are comparing a before and an after effect. Studies that have large numbers of subjects and ones really where there's more potential for benefit than harm. I want to spend just a, a couple minutes on residual confounding because I think that's a, a little bit of a difficult concept. This is an unmeasured or unknown factor present prior to starting the study which could have altered the final results, but it was unknown. For example, a study, a drug study comparing drug A to drug B is discovered, uh, is comparing drug A to drug B. After the end of the study, it is discovered that the group given drug A actually had sicker patients, but this was not accounted for in advance. However, the clinical response was still better for drug A versus drug B. Therefore, the likely benefit of drug A is even better than what was reported in the outcome. Therefore, you could upgrade one level. Downgrading is much more common, and this has occurred in all of our grade guidelines. Take, for example, question number one in the anaphylaxis grade guideline, where we ask about the risk factors for biphasic anaphylaxis. Certainty of evidence ended up being very low. What were part of the reasons behind that? Well, the bias was rated as serious, due to many factors, but examples would be it was retrospective data, there was no randomized studies, and it was a limited patient selection. Everybody was in the hospital, either in the emergency department or as an inpatient. Imprecision was serious. There was a low number of biphasic events and wide confidence intervals. Inconsistency was moderate, and one measure of inconsistency, I square, showed moderate heterogeneity. Now, indirectness was not a problem in this, for this particular question because the study population was the study of interest, those who had biphasic anaphylaxis. Publication bias was rated as none, as it's unlikely to be the case when you're publishing a study about biphasic anaphylaxis. But what if this was the case of a negative drug study? Certainly, that would give the opportunity for publication bias. So the strength of the recommendation is then going to either be strong or conditional. Strong meaning most individuals would prefer the recommendation. Clinicians should be strongly asking the patient to consider this. And policymakers can actually adopt this as policy. On the other hand, conditional means that while most individuals would prefer the, uh, the recommendation, many would not. The clinician has to be aware that there are different choices that could be appropriate for select patients. Therefore, there should be a shared decision-making conversation. And we would not be using this recommendation for policy. As shown graphically, the strength of the recommendation can either be in favor or against a specific action and either strong or conditional. The strength of the recommendation, as we've discussed before, involves many more uh, items than just the, the certainty of evidence. It involves that balance between benefit and harm, 
patient's values and preferences. How much is it going to cost to implement it? What are the policy implications? Is it acceptable to all stakeholders? And is it a priority in terms of, of a problem? I'm going to give you a reference by David Lang and Jay Portnoy that helps to explain grade. And it's something that I think you will want to take a look at as we know that more and more guidelines are coming out in that manner. Deter de determining and documenting the presence and absence of conflict of interest and detailing the methods that we would use to resolve that conflict of interest are very important for any of our guidelines. Work group and joint task force members provide updated COIs which are signed with each practice publica uh, guideline publication as well as they are posted on our website. During guideline development, any recommendation for which a member could have a perceived conflict of interest are asked to recuse themselves from the development, the discussion, and the voting on that particular recommendation or question. There are many different resources and avenues for the various components of a grade guideline to be developed. In fact, the Joint Task Force has used all the ones that are listed here, sometimes more than one for an individual guideline. For example, in the past, we've used Mercy Children's Hospital Librarian and Methodology Group. We are currently using the, the McMaster EMB Group from Canada. We've used the apprenticeship approach with EOE. We've used Dartmouth University graduate class and the Joint Task Force in-house expertise for the anaphylaxis guideline. And we're currently using a medical writer to help with the traditional practice parameters on drug allergy and anaphylaxis. I believe the best way at this point to be able to show you the features of a grade guideline, those produced by the Joint Task Force, but also the new NAEPP asthma guidelines, and how to best review those huge documents, would be to explain the process that we use in developing a grade document. And I think this will give you the insight and structure your reading of those guidelines. When selecting the subject of an upcoming guideline, we have to consider a lot of different factors. When was that subject last updated? Is there a major cause of morbidity or mortality that needs to be addressed? Is there uncertainty regarding some diagnostic or therapeutic intervention that would provide us, if clarified, a better outcome? Or could we conserve resources if we found the answer to that particular question. We will then develop and refine the key questions in the PICO format that I've previously described. Number three step is to define the outcomes of interest and then to rate them as either being critical, important, or not important. We will then be determining the inclusion, exclusion criteria for the articles that will be selected. And at this point, a preliminary literature search may also be uh, in order before proceeding. All of the questions that we just discussed will be, uh, we will have an expert methodologist re weigh in on whether we have actually considered all the possibilities that need to be considered. We will also submit to PROSPERA. This is the International Prospective Registry of Systematic Reviews, which is an online database. We'll, number six, complete the literature search using at least three databases. We also have some other options. The other options would be we could use a recent clinical guideline that's been found to be credible using that 23-item AGREE tool. Now, the AGREE tool stands for Appraisal of Guidelines for Research and Evaluation. Or we could use a pre-existing systematic review and meta-analysis that's high quality. And a way to, to know that is to put it through the 18-item M-STAR to assess the systematic review. 
Number seven is that each abstract and full text article is reviewed by at least two workgroup members. The reviews will keep track of all the records derived from the database, exclusions made, and final studies, including uh, by using this PRISM algorithm, which is published with all of our grade guidelines. Number eight is the final articles are undergo data extraction. Number nine, any missing references and data are going to be requested from the authors. Number 10, the risk of bias table is developed. And this will include a lot of different items, including the number of participants, the outcome measure, study confounding, statistical analysis, overall rating. And then number 11 is other methods to help us with data analysis are developed, such as forest plots and funnel plots. We then also develop what's called a summary of findings table for each question. This includes factors that can downgrade or upgrade evidence, as we previously discussed, the overall certainty of evidence, event rates, relative effect or odds ratio, and the anticipated or an absolute effect. The final step is the evidence to recommendation table. The expert panel's judgment, that includes the Joint Task Force and the work group, are involved in making this final table and, and, and determination under the guidance of a methodologist. And I want, if you remember nothing else from this lecture, remember this is the meat of the guideline. Read this if you read nothing else, because it will provide you a very concise summary of everything that has been completed. Um, it summarizes the question, the background, the perspective, the main outcomes. It provides a clinical statement and the reasons that the expert panel the judgment that was made in all these areas listed, be it certainty of evidence, opportunity, exclusions, quality improvement, etc. Now, when you talk about expert panel judgment, I will admit that there's going to be some subjectivity here because for most of our subject areas, published data to help answer these questions are not existing. We don't have cost effectiveness analysis for all of our subjects. And so, so there's times that we have to use uh, judgment. This is what it looks like. And this is pulled from the anaphylaxis guideline. So here's that first category where you go through the PICO and the perspective and the background. These are the clinical statements that are derived from that question. And then this is the judgment. And I'm not showing you the, all the categories, but as you can see, it's going to contain all the key facts that you need to take away from this grade guideline. So, you might ask, do we still need traditional practice parameters? And I am convinced the answer is an astounding yes. I've discussed the strengths of grade and they certainly engender the highest respect from national and international professional groups. And I want to point out that even those conditional recommendations with low certainty of evidence are of value. You know, perhaps you thought that what you were doing was gospel. It had to be right. But it was really backed up with very weak evidence, and maybe there was room for alternative management strategies. And the development cost in terms of manpower and resources means that we can only answer a few questions for a grade guideline, usually between two and four, or maybe as many as six. Practice parameters are also highly valued by fellows in training, general membership, and educators. They offer an updated summary on a topic. Traditional guidelines can draw upon published literature that would be excluded in grade, summarize all the uh, recent key findings within a subject area, and develop consensus-based statements that are often viewed as useful to the clinician, as are the grade recommendations. And this is just sort of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, with the new 
with the new, and I emphasize that in parentheses, traditional practice parameters, we are completing a systematic single database literature review and developing what we are calling consensus-based statements, which are very similar in format to recommendations in grade. The main difference is that the published data and analysis behind the consensus-based statement is not as rigorous as that of grade. We're using a similar way of reporting, both the strength of evidence and the certainty, strength of recommendation and the certainty of evidence. And both type of guidelines will require actionable statements. And just to compare the number of recommendations, as you can see, anaphylaxis had six for five questions. The new traditional rhinitis had 37. The old 2008 rhinitis had 109 summary statements. So you see there's a big difference, though the statements used to have a lot of information base. Now everything must be actionable. But great evidence-based and practice parameters consensus-based guidelines ultimately will require a consensus when making recommendations. We need to use expert evidence, not opinion. The difference is that expert evidence makes a judgment on the evidence that is available even when high quality research is not available. In the next few minutes, I want to share with you a little bit of the background and history of the Joint Task Force, 1989 to 2021. Richard Nicholas and Joanne Blessing Moore had the brain, brain's child of a joint task force. The insight of Al Sheffer and Phil Lieberman, who I think is with us today, saw the benefit of forming a joint task force. Sponsoring organizations were not only the college and academy at that time, but the Asthma Allergy Foundation of America and the Joint Council of Allergy and Immunology, which of course has evolved into the Advocacy Council of the college. These are the original members of that joint task force, and I'm sure you recognize many of these names, Sheldon Spector, David Perlman, Stan Feynman, and here's just a few photographs representing those years. The first practice parameter was on the diagnosis and treatment of asthma. We now enter the second group of uh, members of the joint task force, including Jay Portnoy, uh, Mark Dykowitz, Diane Schuler. And here's just some pictures of the group hard at work in uh, Chicago. And a very meaningful meeting was held in Washington in December of 1999. The group was invited to tour the White House and then were presented a letter signed by Bill Clinton recognizing the contributions of the Joint Task Force. Again, we are now moving up into more recent times and you'll see David Kahn's name, my name, John Oppenheimer, we all just rotated off in the past couple of years. In 2009, during the college meeting, we actually presented a symposium as a joint task force on urticaria using the grade format. And this is just a picture that is so common from all those Chicago Embassy Suite meetings where we would hold every about three to four times a year doing uh, developing guidelines. And this is our new uh, joint task force. We have five-year terms that are renewable once, and you'll see the members that are represented there. These are some of the more recent photographs of that group. And here is your panel in 2021 of joint task force members. David Golden is our college co-chair. Marcus Shaker is our academy co-chair. But you... People in the audience today, you are the future of allergy specialty. I would like to encourage all of you to consider being part of a work group and subsequently the joint task force in the future. This is the time to start developing the skills that will prepare you for these positions. I hope that training programs start to provide fits with the opportunity to complete systematic reviews meta-analysis, and even guidelines. We do need young, bright leaders such as you. You can find out more about our structure, the current projects, and the qualifications on our website, and you can email us at any time. 
Currently, here are some of the ways that we are using to disseminate guidelines. We try to present at each annual conference of the academy and the college, as we will be doing in a couple of months. Uh, we also want to present to state and regional meetings. COLA presentations like today and, and throughout this year. We have editorials on implementing these guidelines in our journals. We, want to we know that ABAI is now incorporating our guidelines in CAP articles. I just joined the ABAI, and let me assure you that questions are taken from the guidelines in the certifying exam as well. They're used in FIT training programs, and we are going to be encouraging the use of pocket guides. But we also need your creative ideas on how we can do a better job with this. And with that, I want to say thank you, and I'm open to uh, answer any questions that I can do so. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. That was excellent presentation. Um, it was a lot of information to cover in such a short period of time, um, but we appreciate you taking the time to do that. <clears throat> um, does anybody in the audience have any questions for Dr. Wallace? Dr. Wallace, I have a quick question for the okay. fellows. The pocket guides, um, I remember those being of, um, available. I think they may have been handed out at um, one of the college or the academy meetings a few years ago. But for the fellows, if they wanted to get the pocket guides, can they just go to the to the website or where do they go to get those? What's the easiest way? Yes. Um, the most up-to-date is going to be on Guideline Central, and I provided in the slide deck that URL that you can go there and, and look up all the, the available pocket guides. I, sometimes I, th I see that the websites are a little behind on keeping the most updated ones, but they're also on the college and academy websites. And then we also have the link available on the Joint Task Force Allergy Parameters website, so all those locations. Someone has to pay for the hard copies, so they're low cost, but, you know, organizations, the, the college and academy do not routinely produce those and give them out. I see them more so with pharmaceutical companies uh, using them as, as an education means, but um, you can download them free of charge. You can print them out on your own. There's no problem doing so. Anyone have else have any questions? Anyone anxious to uh, to uh, join a work group in the future? I'm going to ask you a question, um, Dr. Wallace. Um, what do you think, from your experience on the the Joint Task Force, what was what was the hardest part of the job for you? I'll put you on the spot. Well, I think that if if you ask the ones of us who've been there the longest, and maybe Dave Kahn would, would chime in, and certainly David Gold and, and I, I think it's making that transition from the, what we'll call the traditional practice parameters to the gray document. It was like speaking a new language, which is why I spent so much time on it today. It really is very, very different than, uh, in both in the development and in knowing how to utilize the, the rent, the, uh, published document. So very different. So that process was very tough. And um, I was the second author on the rhinitis, which was the very first grade document. So I went through all the uh, the learning pains and, and trials and tribulations. So I think that that transition has been tough. Any other questions for Dr. Wallace this morning? And I, uh, David Golden, would you like to say anything to the group today? I'm going to uh, offer your, your, you to open up your mic if you would like to. I'm not sure if he's hearing me or not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there you are, David. David, would you like to say something? You'll need to unmute your microphone if you're going to speak. He's unmuted here, but I'm not sure. I, we, we are not hearing you, David. 
Anyway, I was just going to give him the opportunity since he's leading this effort now. But um, we just want and appreciate any feedback that we can get. We want to make our guidelines better. Uh, we want, you know, the guidelines are not any value if no one reads them. So we want to know ways that we can disseminate them and make them uh, more applicable to your practice. We're going to um, have the, um, um, the practice parameters, um, as I said earlier, uh, start pre presenting a, a regular talk on the most recent practice parameters. The next talk um, will be um, in March, and I sent Dr. Golden um, an email this morning about trying to set that up with, this, with the proposed speaker. Um, but our plan is to have a talk every two months as a regular series. So over the course of the two years of a fellow's regular uh, fellowship, <clears throat> that um, we'd be able to um, uh, cover uh, the major practice parameters of the most updated ones. Um, and this will help prepare the fellows for practice, but also for things like the board as well. So that's great. Um, we appreciate the all the efforts of the people on the practice parameters, present and past. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort, um, and um, it's a tremendous service to our specialty. So um, I want to thank you, Dr. Wallace, for speaking this sure. morning, all the members of the task force, um, and. Um, um, if there's no other questions, we will um, adjourn for today. And again, thanks for your time. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Very, very much my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good week.